Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Steve, like I was just mentioned. And for those of you who do know me, I'm sorry, I apologize. Bill, I was really waiting for you to laugh when I said that. So, so in all seri seriousness, let's just take a brief moment here and prepare our hearts and our minds as we listen to God's word, what he has for us today. Luke 18, 18 through 30. A certain ruler asked God, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these things I kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, how then can be saved? Or who then can be saved, excuse me? Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife, or brothers, or parents, or children, for the sake of the kingdom of God, will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. This is God's word. Well, good morning. My name is Joel. I'm the senior pastor here. Glad to be with you this morning, whether you're worshiping with us in person or online. Uh, thank you for allowing Beck and I to get a few, a uh, couple weeks of holiday. We really enjoyed it. Uh, got, to, uh, got to have a chance to be grandma and grandpa again. And wow, uh, grandkids are not for the faint of heart, right? I mean, my word, they will, uh, it seems like they have more energy than, than there is time of the day. But we really enjoyed that time and just being able to get away and uh, just to spend a few days as well in a cabin and doing nothing and being really good at it to recharge our batteries and get back in here as we start out the summer. And this morning, as we continue on in our series called Questions, Jesus asked like 300 questions, and we're focusing in on 10 of those questions. And we'll finish out next week in, the, in this series. But have you ever asked a question that you, you thought you knew the answer to? Or a question was asked, and oh, you, you knew the answer to that, only to find out you really didn't have the answer to that question? Yeah. So little Joel is sitting in second grade Miss James's class, and she asked the question. So class, where does chocolate milk come from? Oh, oh, I knew this one. I knew this one because I'd heard this one at home. I, I knew this one. I didn't, I didn't answer, answer many questions in class, but I knew this one. And so Miss James, she, she called him and she said, Joel, what's, where does chocolate milk come from? And I knew this one because I'd heard it. It said chocolate milk comes from brown cows. And when the class stopped laughing and the teacher stopped laughing, she said, no, Joel, chocolate milk comes from milk that chocolate has been added to. I didn't know that. All my time I'd heard this at home, I, I knew the answer to this question. So I go home and ask, I said to my mom and dad, they said, so, chocolate milk doesn't come from brown cows, huh? And they kind of look at me like, what are you talking about? And I said, they asked in class today, where does chocolate milk come from? And I told them from brown cows, and they're like, Oh, honey, you, you, you didn't say that, did you, really? We were only joking with you. Well, how was I to know? I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an impressionable little kid. Sometimes we think we know the answer, when in fact we don't. If I were to ask you the question, so you're standing before God, and he says, why should I allow you into heaven? How would you answer that question? I say it because I've asked that many times in baptismal classes and in church membership classes. And I don't always hear a very good response. 
We should know the answer to that question. Why should you be allowed into heaven? It's a question that we should be able to answer. But sometimes we have an answer, but it's not the correct answer. There was a rich young man who came to Jesus, and I think he asked the question knowing that he had the answer to the question. Only the day's not going to go well for him. Jesus isn't going to answer his question the way that he thought he was going to. The man that we're going to meet, he's called a rich young ruler. One of the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, say that he is young, but he's rich. He's rich. He's a civic leader. He's not a religious leader because he's young. If to be a, a, a religious leader, he had, would have had to have been at least 30 years old. So we know that he's, he's young, he's rich, he's a, a civic ruler. One of the commentaries I read, tooth and uh, tongue in cheek, said he was probably handsome as well. And on top of this, he is very religiously devout. This guy's got everything going for him. And he comes to Jesus and he asks this question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I wonder why he asked that question. He's got everything. I mean, this guy's got everything. Why does he ask this question? I mean, he's got money, he's got power, he's got position, he's got all this stuff. Why does he ask this question? I wonder if there's in two sides to this coin. I wonder if in one sense he was asking because we're going to find out he's a pretty good person. And I wonder if he thought that he just had to do something good. But I wonder, too, if there wasn't something in his heart that he had everything, but yet he had nothing. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? You can have everything, but if you, have, you don't have Christ in your life, you don't have anything. And I wonder, was there something missing in his life? I wonder, as we come this morning, is there something missing in our life where we ask the question, is this all there is to life? You're pushing the, the shopping cart at Aldi. And you've got your shopping cart full and you're looking at the different stuff. And a thought passes through your head. Is this all that there is to life? You come back from an incredibly hard day at the office. And you've got some windshield time. And you're asking yourself, is this all that there is to life? Getting up, going to work, having a tough day at work, and then going home and repeating this every single day. Is this all that there is to life? And I wonder as we come in here this morning, if we, are not, if we don't ask ourselves those questions from time to time, is this all there is? And Jesus asks, he asks this question of Jesus. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus doesn't answer the question. He answers the question with another question. Why do you call me good? Why do you, what are you saying with that? Why do you call me good? Because there is no one good except God. This is a powerful phrase. Why did he call him good? Because in this culture, when you called somebody good, you wanted them to reciprocate and call you good as well. Jesus doesn't do that. He says, what are you, what are you saying? Because by you saying that I'm good, are you also saying that I'm God? And are you saying that you're good? Because there's no one that's good except God alone. There's no one who is good except God alone. God is the only one that is good. i got to see one. As we read in um, 1, Chron 1 Chronicles 16.34, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. I'm going to throw three scriptures at you really quickly. We read in Psalm chapter 34, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Nahum chapter 1 verse 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. The Lord is good. God is good. Then what does it mean to be good? Because there is inherent goodness in every single one of us. I mean, we've met people from time to time who are really good people. I mean, people give the shirt off their back kind of people. I mean, just salt of the earth kind of people. Is that what it means? Or is there something more? There is inherent goodness, and then there is divine goodness. And wrapped up in that issue of goodness, the goodness of God, it's like, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, when my brother was a missionary in Russia, they had these, these kind of dolls, you know, that you, you pull one off, and then, what do they call them, matryoshka dolls or something like that? And you, you take one off, and there's another one inside. The goodness of God is like that. Because wrapped up within the goodness of God is the justice of God is the righteousness of God, is the mercy of God, is the compassion of God, is the love of God. It's all wrapped up in the goodness of God. That's, and think of it, this blows my mind. When you think about the goodness of God, all of those things are perfect. Absolutely perfect. We may be good 
inherently good, but we're not perfect. And that's what this is going to come back to. We may be inherently good, but we're not perfect. Jesus was perfect. God is perfect. He is good in all that he does. Now, hold on to your hats. Because when we say that God is good, it also means that everything that God gives us, everything that God does in our lives is also good. That's a hard one to get our hands around, isn't it? Because sometimes we walk through things, and you may be walking through something right now, and you're saying, I don't like this, I don't want to be in this place, and this to me isn't good. But hear me, God in all that he does is good. We may not like it, we may not want to be in that space, but God is good, and he is seeking to do something in the midst of that. Now, can I ask you to do a very simple thing for me this morning? Can you repeat after me? Think of that situation that you're in right now. And can you say in the midst of that situation, would you repeat after me, God, you are good. You are in this, and you are good. God, you're in this, and you're good. He is good, isn't he? He is good. We may not like it. We may not want to be in that place, but he is good. And what he gives us... See, here's the, phrase, here's the thing. God cannot give you anything but his very best. For God to give you anything but his very best denies his very nature. So where I'm at, as much as I may not like it, it is God's goodness towards me. And God has something in mind. And if I can wrap myself around that to say, God, I don't like this. I don't want to be in this place. But you know what is best and you are giving me my, my best in the midst of this situation. Lord, help me. Help me, please, to embrace what it is that you are doing in my life in the midst of this. Because you are in this and you are good. Amen? Amen. Well, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. This guy, he, Jesus turns around to him and he says, why do you call me good? There's no one that's good except God. And then he turns it around and he says to him, you know the commandments. And see, for this guy, the notion that being good, the, he, he's walking down a path where he thinks that if I'm good, that's good enough. That's good enough that we can, and we sometimes fall into that same trap, that if I'm good, if I'm, if I'm good enough, that we can somehow earn eternal life. And Jesus is going to turn this on its head. And he speaks to him and he says, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Now this is the, this is the back half of the Ten Commandments. The first, if you think, you look at the cross over here. If you think about the Ten Commandments, the first of the Ten Commandments deal with our relationship with us and God. The rest of them deal with our relationship with one another. And these are the ones that Jesus is focusing on. And he says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. To which he responds, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Now you know what Jesus could have done? What he, what he could have done is said, hmm, that's interesting. Do you remember back in 31? You, you, let's see, it was June 2nd of 31. You were on your way home. You had a busy day, and you were on your way home. And you took a shortcut through Jerusalem. And in the process, you came across a young girl taking the hand of a man who was obviously blind. And she stopped you, and she said, Please, sir, could you, could you help us out? And you looked at the man, and you looked at the little girl, and you kept right on walking. You didn't take care of that need. You had the ability, didn't you? Or he could have said, you know, it was again in 31, but it was in October of 31. You were approached by one of, the, one of your fellow leaders, and you were asked a question that if you would have answered it truthfully, it would have compromised who you were. And so instead of saying the truth, you told a bold-faced lie. Jesus could have done that, couldn't he? But, but he didn't. In this guy's mind, he was good, wasn't he? He had kept the commands. In his mind, he was good. 
And I wonder if this isn't an issue with why he asked this question in the first place. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Because in his eyes, he's a fairly good person. I mean, he's done the things that God has asked him to do. The problem comes in is that when we think that we're good, what does that tend to do in us? How does that affect the way that we look at others? And I wonder if in his life, maybe I could be wrong. I've been wrong once today already. Um, I wonder if he didn't play the comparison game. Well, I, I, may, be, I may be good, or I may, I, I may have not, not kept all the commands the way I should have, but at least I'm better than that person. It's a dangerous game when we compare ourselves with others. Because remember, there's no one that's good except God alone. We read in Scripture in Romans chapter 3, it says, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeks after God. There is none that understands. All have turned away. They've tur- together become worthless. And there is no one who does good, not even one. He- hear this. If we are left to our own devices, we would never have chosen God. We would never have chosen God. Jesus said, No one comes to the Father except the one who sent me. Or except... except No one comes to the Father except that the one who uh, sent me draws them to me. We don't come to God on our own. It is the mercy of God that draws us to himself. And he says, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeks after God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all come to Christ at the same level, don't we? We may have high standing. We may have low standing. We may have have a lot of money in the bank. We may have nothing in the bank. But we all come to God at the same place. We are all sinners who, are, who need a Savior, correct? Amen. Amen. That's where we come from. And I wonder with this guy, he thought, well, I, I'm pretty good. The problem with being pretty good is it's not enough, is it? When we think that we can be good enough to merit eternal life, we need to remember the standard is not something or someone. The standard is God, and he's perfect. The standard is God, and he, he's perfect. I remember as a kid, mom asking me, go, go clean your room. Hmm? I, I was a slob when I was a kid. Um, thank the Lord I got married, and I got married to someone who's not a slob. But as a young boy, my room was a mess. And I don't know, boys, if that's the way they are. I had three boys. They're all slobs. I mean, just they, they were. And as a, as a boy, I didn't want to be making my, I didn't want to be cleaning my room. I wanted to be outside playing baseball or football or going fishing or whatever it was. And so when mom told me, clean your room, I cleaned the room like every red-blooded American boy does in this world, right? I made the bed really good because I knew she was going to look at the bed. And thank the Lord for a long cover, you know, the, the top, the, whatever you call it, thing, the top, the, the, you know, the top of the, what, you, what you don't sleep on, you know, that comes down to the floor. And thank the Lord for a long one of those. Because where did everything go? Under the bed, in the closet. So I went back out to mom and I said, it's all done. And she said, wow, that didn't take much time at all. She came into the room and like a, like a general doing, a, you know, doing an inspection, she looked around and she said, Your bed's made nice. Then she did one of these. She took her foot and just lifted up the up the bottom cover, and she said, "Uh, "What's what's all under there?" And then she went over to the closet and she looked in the closet. It's just you know a pile of junk all in the closet. And she said, "Uh, "You didn't do what I asked you to do. I told you to clean your room, make your bed, clean your room, and you just jammed it all under the bed, jammed it in the closet." And you know, when I think about that, when we say that we're good, God doesn't look at the outside. He looks at the inside, doesn't he? And we can have a tendency to make things look good on the outside, but it's the inside that God is concerned about. It's the inside that God looks at. And what he demands is perfection. Not all but you. I, I, can't, I can't do that any more than I can ask one of my grandsons to get in a car and drive to Milwaukee. I, it's not possible. I can't be perfect. And th- See, here's the thing. The standard was perfection. And for, for me to be able to, to have forgiveness of my sins, for me to pay the price would have demanded perfection. And there's not one of us that's perfect. But God sent his son, who was perfect, 
to take my place, to not only take the place and forgive me of my sins, but to also incur the wrath of God upon himself, the wrath that I should have gotten, he took on my behalf because he was perfect in all that he did. He was absolutely perfect in all that he did. You know, when we think about perfection, this guy thought he was perfect. He thought he was good. But the standard wasn't something or someone. The standard was God, and he was perfect. And Jesus says to him, just look at that first line. This is coming out of Mark. Same, I'm in Luke today, but this is the same parallel passage coming out of Mark. How did Jesus look at him? What does it say? He loved him. He doesn't say, you've got to be kidding me. You think you obeyed all the commandments since you were a boy? I can name them all off the ones you didn't do. But he doesn't do that. Much like he doesn't do that in our lives. He asks another question, or he gives us another command. And he says, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. What what in the world is Jesus saying here? Is he saying that... (laughs) That if, if, I just, if I just go and sell everything that I have and give to the poor, that I can have eternal life? What do you think? I hope not. No. <laughs> He's not saying, this is very localized for this guy here. He's not saying, go sell everything. He's not saying to us, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come follow me. He is pointing out that thing in this guy's life that is standing in the way of him having a relationship with God. And I wonder, because for this guy, I mean, his whole, his whole life was tied up. His identity and self-worth were tied up in his money and his possessions. And for this guy, Jesus is pointing out to him that thing in his life that is keeping him from coming to Christ. I wonder what that thing might be in our lives. That thing in our lives that as a, maybe as you maybe you're not a Jesus follower yet, and that thing in your life might be, I just don't buy it. I mean, I'm glad that it works for you, Pastor. I'm glad that it works for others, but I just don't buy it. I mean, I I just, I can't see how this all fits together. That might be that thing that God says, this is what you lack. Will you trust me? Will you come to faith? Some of you as well who have not chosen to follow Christ, maybe it's, I've seen the way that Christians act. People who call themselves Christians, I see the way they act. One of them? Nah, not hardly. And for some of us, that thing may be the way you look at other people. Because <laughs> church is full of people who, we're not perfect, right? We're going to hurt one another. We're going to do things that frustrate one another. We're not perfect, even on our best day. But for this guy, and for us, what is that thing? For you as a believer, What is that thing that is keeping you from going into a deeper relationship with God? God wants to go deep with you in your life, but this is something that keeps coming up in your life. Could it be a lack of forgiveness? Somebody did something to you a while back. They hurt your feelings. They they said something about you. They said something about your kids, and it is just stuck in your craw, and you you can't get loose of it. And God would be saying, that's what is keeping you from going into a deeper relationship with me. Would you give that to me? It could be a lack of desire on our part. It could be as well bitterness on our part. It could be as well a vice in our lives where God is saying, this is what's keeping you. I want to go deep with you, but I can't. What is that thing in your life? Okay, you got it? So what are you going to do with it? The God of heaven wants to go deep in your life. God of heaven wants to have a relationship with you. But he can't. Because that's standing in the way, and that's what you need to give over to him. For some of us, we, need to, we know what it is already. And are we willing to lay that down so that we can have the relationship? Are we willing to give that over to God so that we can have a relationship with him for eternity? For this guy, 
When Jesus points out to him that thing in his life, what, what's his response? When he heard this, he said he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. He heard it. But what was his response? I get it. I see it. But I don't think I can do it. It's impossible. I get it. I see it. But I don't think I can do it. I don't think I want to do it. It's impossible. Remember that thing that we just talked about? That thing in your life? How do you respond as Jesus speaks to you about that thing in your life? See, we have one of two ways we go. We go either the way of the rich young ruler and walk away. Or we go the way of another man we're going to meet in a little bit. By laying that thing down. Because it's not impossible. It's not. It's a willingness on our part. But you see, he says, Jesus looked at him and he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now I want to just focus on the top part first. Jesus looked at him and said, you know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't go after him. He didn't go after him. When this guy walked away, Jesus didn't go after him. He said, well, that's not, not very loving. Oh, it, it is loving. Jesus, when we come to him, we will never be forced to choose Christ. He never, he never takes us by the scruff of the shirt and says, you choose me. He doesn't do that. He gives us a choice. We have a choice of whether or not to choose Christ or to not choose Christ. But every single one of us will spend an eternity in one of two places, and it will be the place of your choosing. God will never force you to choose him. He will let him walk away. That's hard, isn't it? He lets people walk away because we have to make a choice of who it is that we're going to serve. Are we going to serve God or are we going to serve ourselves? And he walked away. And Jesus said how hard it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. You know, it's, it's just as hard sometimes for a poor person or a middle class person to enter into the kingdom of God. It is. Especially in this day and age. It, it's hard. It's hard for people to enter into the kingdom of God. And yet, it's not impossible. I want to just look at the... It's not impossible. Because in, in the next chapter, we're in chapter 18, chapter 19, Jesus is literally like two weeks away from the cross. And as he's leaving where it was that he was with the rich young ruler, he's entering into the city of Jericho. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And as he walks into Jericho, he meets a guy who's blind. His name is Bartimaeus. He asks, Lord, Lord, Je Lord son of Jesus, son of David, have mercy upon me. He says, what do you want me to do? He said, I want to see. And Jesus gives him his sight. As he continues walking into Jericho, there's another man there that he's going to meet. Two men who in many ways were different, but in many ways who were the same. They were both rich. They were both very rich. They both had positions of authority. They both had needs in their lives that only Jesus could answer. But only one responded. And we meet him. His name is Zacchaeus. And as Jesus walks down the road, I wonder if there wasn't a crowd of people standing under the tree looking at Zacchaeus and saying, oh, that, that's Zacchaeus up there under the tree. He's the chief tax collector. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. For I want to have a meal at your house today. Scandalous. Absolutely scandalous. For a person of Jesus' position to have a meal with a tax collector, not just any tax collector, the chief tax collector. It was scandalous. It was by, by doing that, he was saying that, that I want to spend time with you. I believe in you. And Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house. A true path to eternal life involves a transfer of trust. Somewhere along the time of where Jesus is going to Zacchaeus' house and there is a meal, there's been a transfer of trust. Because Zacchaeus stands up and says, Lord, here and now, I give half of what I owe, own to the poor. Half. There, that was a lot for Zacchaeus. I mean, he was an incredibly rich man. And then he says, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, 
if, if, that's like, is a, does a skunk stink? I mean, if, I mean, you, that's the way you lived your life. And he says, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I give back four times the amount. What was the amount that was required? It was two times. And he said, he's going to double this. What is that key of saying in effect? I give it all. I give it all. One was not willing to give it all. One gave it all. How? Voluntarily. Did Jesus even ask him to do that? He didn't. He didn't. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Why? Because he gave it all away? No, because he'd made a transfer of trust. Zacchaeus was willing to transfer his... I don't know if Zacchaeus even worried about... Maybe he did worry about where he was going to spend eternity. But for this guy, he had committed... He not only broken every commandment, but I think he enjoyed breaking some of the commandments. I mean, this is just the kind of guy Zacchaeus was. And you think, this is the kind of guy that came to Christ. And we look at some people and we say, there is no hope for that boy. You know, he is never going to come to Christ. That, she is never going to change. It's like a leopard changing her spots. That's never going to happen. What's impossible with us is possible with God, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Who then can be saved? God can save people, can he? In the many years of ministry that have been in, I, I shake my head sometimes at some of the people that I've seen come to Christ. Because they came out of really rough backgrounds, tough backgrounds, some out of really good backgrounds to see them come to Christ. It's God who does the work of saving. It's God who does the work of drawing our hearts. It's us who respond to the call of God in our lives. It's not impossible. Don't stop praying for somebody. You got somebody in your life, you have a wayward child who's not walking with the Lord. You know, they're called today, I've been reading a book, and they're called Exvangelicals. These are kids who grew up in the church, who had a relationship with Christ, and who have chosen for whatever reason to not have anything to do with the church. And I look around and I know that many of us have kids in that very place today. Who then can be saved? God's the one who saves them. And even though they may turn their back on God, God hasn't turned their back on him. Because we read in Scripture, Jesus said, I give them eternal life. I'm going to geek you here just for a second. He said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. You've heard me say this before, and it's especially true in this verse. There's two of them. When the Greek uses a double negative, a double negative in, he, in English is, I ain't got no. I mean, we don't, we don't talk like that. I hope not, anyway. But he says, they shall never perish. That's a double negative. And no one, that's also a double negative there. When, G, when they do that in Greek, it's to enforce how emphatic it is. So when Jesus says, I give them eternal life, listen to that. Who gives us eternal life? Uh, okay, this is an all play. I've been gone for a few weeks, I can tell. Who gives us eternal life? Jesus. It's Jesus. It is only Jesus who gives us eternal life. Only Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. That's the only way. He said, I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. Eternal life is not something you earn. It's not something you do something for. It is a gift, a gift that we choose to receive or to reject. But it is a gift that we receive from God. And he says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Listen to this. Especially those of you who have children who have walked away from the Lord. If they made a true confession for Christ, are they his? What did you do to earn your salvation? Nothing. Your salvation is not based on anything you've done. It's based on what was done at the cross of Christ for you. Your identity is in the cross. It is not in who you are or in what it is that you've done. And when you make a true confession to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are His. And they shall never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. You are God's. And sometimes we struggle with doubt as well. We go back to a verse like this. Did you make a profession for Christ? Did you by faith choose to walk, you know, to invite Christ into your life? Then you are His then you are his. You did nothing to earn your salvation. What do you do to lose your salvation? You don't. 
Okay, and I know for some of you, you're, right now all your hackles are going up because you believe that. I, I struggle with that because of this and the way that it's written. And this isn't just the only place. When you are God's child, it is a gift from God. And it is he who gives us eternal life. And it is he who said you'll never perish. And it is he who said that no one can snatch them out of, my heart, out of my hand. And it is he who said, behold, I'm coming soon. All of the promises of God, can I believe them? I can. Why? Because the grave is empty. Jesus paid the price at the cross. And when he rose from the dead, I can totally believe in what it is that he said. And he says that you are his. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. And as I think about this man here, he chose to walk away. And Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I've met, when we were in Hong Kong, we had many who were very rich. It's not impossible. But it is really, it is really where is your allegiance? Is it to the things that you have or is your allegiance God? Do you have things or do the things have you? And Peter says, we've left all to follow you. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to make this transfer of trust? Is it it worth it? I mean, Peter said, we've left everything to follow you. Peter and his brother Andrew, James and John, what did they do? They left everything. They left the family business. They left dad. They left the boats. They left the nets. They left the workers. Everything to follow Jesus. Matthew, the tax collector who follows Jesus, he had a very lucrative, albeit very dishonest line of work. And yet when Jesus says, follow me, he followed him. The question for us this morning is, who will you follow? Who will you follow? Will you follow Christ or will you follow yourself? For this rich young man, he chose to follow himself rather than following God. Who do we follow? Is it worth it? Is it worth the exchange? Because eternal life doesn't just start when, we, when, we, when the breath, or when our heart stops beating. Eternal life starts right now. Because God came to give us joy. He came to give us hope. He came to give us peace. He gave, came to give us a sense of purpose and who he is. It starts now. Is it worth it? It is worth it. It is worth it. And my question for us this morning goes back to where I started. So, if I were to ask you, If Jesus were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? How would you answer that question? Because it's not based on what you've done. So how do you answer that question? I think you answer, I don't think, you answer the question because I chose to believe in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. That's it. It's by grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's grace. And that's what we say. That's what we should say. And so how will you answer that question? Have you chosen to receive Christ? Have you chosen him or have you chosen not to receive him? And for some of us this morning, we're listening to that question. We're thinking, okay, um, I, think I, I think I know the answer to that question. Does God want us to think we know the answer to the question or does he want us to be sure? He says in 1 John chapter 5, I write these things to you who believe that you will know that you have everlasting. God wants us to know that we have everlasting life. Why? Because when you know where it is you're going to spend eternity, you live your life with purpose. And you live your life knowing that I have a hope in Christ. This world isn't all that there is to it. And my question for you this morning is, do you know? Do you know where it is you're going to spend eternity? Because at the end of the day, what I want is for you to be sure. And so how, do you, how can you be sure? If you're not sure of where it is you'll spend eternity, you can be sure before you leave, the, before you leave church today. I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray to receive Christ. And for some of us, that thing, that thing right now is, well, if I choose to admit in front of these people that I'm not a Christian, what will they think about me? Okay, seriously? Seriously? We're going we're gonna to bank eternity on, on what it is that somebody else thinks about me in the in situation? Please, don't, don't let that be that thing in your life. It doesn't matter what other people think. It's where you're going to spend eternity. And so I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray to receive Christ. You say, what, what do I have to do for that? Three, it's very simple. 
Admit that you need a Savior. Jesus came for those who needed... Well, Jesus came to be our Savior. Admit that we're a sinner. Not a hard thing, is it? Admit or repent of our sins. Go from, we're going in this direction, we turn around, we go in the direction that God wants us to go. And lastly, receive. Receive that gift of salvation from Christ. He's the one who gives it to us. He's the one that's offering that to us this morning. If you don't know where you're going to spend eternity, if you're thinking, okay, well, I'm a pretty good person, or I've done these things and God would never want me, we all come to Christ at the same place. And sometimes, too, you think, well, I, I don't believe in God. Well, God believes in you, and he desires to have a relationship with you. And he is the one that even though you may reject him, he still continues to call and to call you to his side. For those of you who are Jesus followers this morning, so what is that thing in your life? That thing that is standing in the way of you having a relationship, a deeper relationship with God. I got a hunch he's put his hand on what it is. Are you willing to give that over to him and say, I lay it down because I want to walk with you in a deeper way. We're going to also have a time of prayer around that this morning as well. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for your word this morning. And thank you that you always speak the truth in love and lovingly. You deeply care about each and every one of us. You see what some of us are walking through right now. It isn't fun. We don't like it. And we can't imagine a good God allowing us to walk through something like this. And yet, God, you do. Because you can't give us anything but your very best. And I don't have all the theological answers for all the theological questions surrounding that. But by faith, I believe what your word has said, that you are good. Even when things around me are not good. God in heaven, would you in a very precious and tender way meet those today who are walking through times that are not good. And God, would you strengthen them? Would you be that precious prince of peace in their life? Would you be mighty God and our everlasting Father? I pray as well, Lord, for each one here. Lord, for some of us, you're our Savior. But it's kind of like you, you, you become a sticker on the lunchbox of our life. We just added you to a bunch of stuff in our life and you didn't come to be a sticker on our lunchbox. You came to be our life. But there are those things that stand in the way of you having the relationship that you desire in our lives. And this morning as you sit before the Lord in prayer, I got a hunch that he's laid his hand on that thing already. Would you willingly say, God, I give it over to you. I want a deeper walk with you. God, take this. And as you came this morning, for some of us, we're good people. But we have heard this morning that good isn't good enough. And you want to have a relationship with Christ. With every head bow, every eye closed, can I ask if that's what you want to do, if you want to have a relationship with Christ for the first time today, 
Would you just do that? Do a simple thing. Just look up at me, and I want to have a word of prayer with you. If you're looking up at me, you're saying, I want to pray to receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Is that what you want? All right, cool. Anybody else? Have no fear. Just pray along with me then in your heart. Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning, and I thank you that you love me. You've always loved me. And I thank you that you've drawn my heart to you today. And I confess to you, Lord, that I'm a sinner. I'm not proud of it. But I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And today I repent of my sins. And I choose to walk in the way that you want me to walk. As you come into my life, I receive you as my personal Savior. Come into my life and make my life new. I pray for your joy, for your happiness. And that you would help me to see things through your eyes now. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed along with me this morning, I'm going to touch base with you after church. But even if you didn't look up at me, you prayed with me, grab me by the arm and, and tell me that you prayed with me. Because what we do is when somebody comes to, comes to Christ, uh, just like a baby when they're born, you don't throw them in the crib and say, grow. Uh, we want to come alongside of you and help you to grow in your, in your walk with Christ. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that God is the one who draws people to his hearts. Amen? Amen. 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 Now may the Lord God Almighty, may he walk with you this week in whatever it is and wherever it is that, in whatever and wherever it is that he has you. May he show himself to be Almighty God in your life. And may you come to know him in a deeper and in a richer way. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.